All right. Uh, in the next section, we'll look at quicksort, which is the second big efficient sorting algorithm uh, that's out there. Uh, and it's very relevant in, in practice. Again, to wake you up a little bit and see how many of you have done this before, let's try to get a sense of that. Oh, how many people are here today? Seventy. And maybe three on the live stream. Who knows? Okay, interesting. So I'll, I'll give you a minute. Let's, let's put it at least 60. That is 60. All right. So we have a clear, clear winner in terms of the majority, but Lots of other uh, answers as well. Um, so I would say the first first for me is the right one. Uh, there was quite a few people for the for number D, I think, right? A few, yep. So. Um, I think the the formulation is so vague that it's it's hard to say no. This is not what we're doing. Uh, Quicksort also swaps elements around, but the the key thing is is part one. Um, so around two thirds or so. So let me not rush rush through this too much because it's just too beautiful an algorithm, and we will build on this a little later in this unit again. So it's it's worth making sure this works. Yeah. Pardon? Uh, okay, yeah, D, D could be said as bubble sorting. Uh, that's what I had in mind, at least. But um, admittedly, the description is so vague, right? You know, it swaps some out of order elements. Yeah, well, which which sorting algorithm doesn't? Uh, yeah, good point. I'm I'm. There's a lot of other sorting algorithms that we don't discuss, mostly because uh, a lot of you have will have heard about them, and they're not that interesting. Like bubble sort is great, just no, don't ever use it because there's hardly any scenario where it would be faster than pretty much anything else. So I'll, I'll just focus on the two that are relevant in practice. For quicksort, we need this notion of partitioning. And I've, uh, I've drawn these kind of diagrams for merging before. So here again, um, I'm, I'm representing the height is the value of, of these elements, and it's or well, some uh, continuous approximation. Just imagine this is a, a large array with many, many elements. The, the idea of partitioning is we have something entirely unsorted, could be just arbitrary, uh, arbitrary chaos. What we want is something like this. And now here the, the point is that there is um, a pivot point where I can draw a, a vertical line. So in value space, I can separate the elements to the right are all bigger than a certain line, and the elements to the left are all below that certain line. That's the dashed red line. Uh, and we usually think of this as happening at some position. Now, notice in this picture, this is not necessarily in the middle, right? Uh, partitioning just says there should be some dividing line. It could be higher or lower, and where the split is between the smaller and the larger elements is also anywhere. We don't necessarily insist that it's exactly in the middle. Question? No. 
Uh, it doesn't have to be the median, that was the question. It's just, so partitioning in principle says there is some such point. Uh, it, could be, it could be anywhere. Uh, how does that look in, in terms of an algorithm? So this is just essentially a specification. That's what we would like to have at the end. How do we get there? Uh, and I'll, again, there's many ways to do this. I'll show you the, the, the one that's fast and relevant uh, and um, is a little more tricky to follow, maybe. Bear with me for a minute. It works as follows. Uh, we first select a pivot element. That will be this guy at the very end. But we, for now, just pick an arbitrary one. And if the input is random, we might as well just pick the first one. At least that's what the example does. And now uh, we start with um, the next element after it and compare it with our pivot. In this case, this is a smaller element. And uh, remember, at the end, the smaller elements should be on the left. So this, this is actually fine where it is. So we just leave it alone and move on. Then we go to the next one. This is obviously bigger. So it's, it's not in the right place. So we want to get it somewhere else. Now this is where we can be smart or less smart. The less so smart methods try to get this thing, get this thing moved away uh, immediately. The smarter way is to delay that and say, okay, hold on, I'll keep a note that this, this has to go, but let's start from the other end. So you have a, a second pointer that scans from right to left and does the same game. So this element is bigger than the pivot, but it's on the right side, so this is, this is fine. It can stay where it is. So we leave it alone and go to the next one. Uh, that's smaller. So being on the right is the wrong thing for that one. But that's a match made in heaven, right? We now have a big one on the left and a small one on the right. So let's just swap those two. And then they're both happy and we can move on. That's, that's how it works. Okay. Again, I, I think many of you will have seen exactly this, but uh, uh, sometimes people do the slightly less sophisticated version. I wanted to show off the, the fast one. So we keep doing the same thing. If it's small and it's on the left, we can leave it alone. Same happens here. If we find a big one, we have to stop again and pass control to the pointer on the right. Uh, that one's big, so on the right can stay where it is. Here we find another one. And so again, two that are both in the wrong side, so we swap them. And at this point, um, we notice that we're done by the fact that the two pointers, they, they start on the outside and then eventually they have to cross. And once that happens, that's our signal to stop. And if I go a step back, so we have achieved basically this partitioning on this, on this element, on this array. The only thing that's left is that there's this pivot element that's currently still in the, in the first position. But one more swap fixes that. Okay, and now we have our picture from above with uh, the dividing line. Okay. Uh, let's point out a few things. First of all, we didn't need any extra space. We needed to remember uh, two or three pointers, but that's, that's all. We didn't need this buffer area for merging. Uh, if you carefully go through this again, you'll see that we visit each element only once. So we move a pointer to, to an element some, at some point. We do a comparison with the pivot, and then we either move it away right now or we wait. But every element is, is just receiving a pointer once and maybe is swapped. So that's similar to merging. Uh, and a nice outcome at the end, we're not just guaranteeing that the array afterwards has this shape. We can also easily return the position where the pivot landed so that we know what is the left and the right part. That's not so relevant for partitioning itself, but we'll use partitioning as a building block, right? And for that, it's useful to not have to find the position again. So we can just return this. Now, at this point, uh, eh, sometimes the question pops up, uh, how often do you have to implement your own sorting algorithm? Not, not ever usually, because mm, all programming languages come with a, a sorting algorithm built in that is usually at least decent or heavily engineered and 
better what you could come up with on in a few hours. Uh, so you don't usually write your own sorting method. There's hopefully no normally no reason to. However, if <laughs> it happens for some reason, maybe because you use partitioning uh, directly in, in as part of some other thing. So again, if you're programming C++, it has a built-in partition function. I think Java and Python, not sure about Python. I think Java doesn't. So maybe you have to write partitioning. If so, use this code. There's many subtleties to get wrong, which have to do with dealing with equal elements. So there's a, a historical story behind this. Uh, there was a famous bug report where someone, the, the standard Unix sort implementation, somehow became awfully slow. And what the person did was he had a file with just zeros and ones. And he wanted to count how many zeros are in that file. Now, OK, maybe it's bollocks to sort that file and find out how many zeros there are that way. On the other hand, you know, sorting is implemented, so why bother writing your own code if you can just call a function? So he sorted that and found out that this goes super slow. And the reason was that the partitioning didn't deal with um, equal elements really well. And uh, that's an interesting, tricky story. I just wanted to share the, the gist of it. So this method will not completely explode in that instance. And it has other favorable properties. Other than that, I don't think we, we need this code specifically. But I felt if I show you the fancy one and not the proper code, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't sleep well. Yeah, I know. OK, uh, that was partitioning. We haven't sorted yet. Uh, for, for sorting to work, we get to, again, a recursive procedure. And the outcome will be called quicksort because it happens to be fairly quick. Now, it was maybe a daft decision of Tony Hoare to call it quicksort right away. Uh, but uh, he, he was right in the end. So again, as for merge sort, if we just have a single element, nothing to do. Otherwise, uh, we do well a, a simple step to find some pivot. We'll refine that step a little bit. But for now, you could just say, um, Pick the first position as in the example. There's already some caveats. We'll come to it. Once you have a pivot chosen, you call this partition function. So after that, your input is in this, in this shape. I don't know. I, uh, can I draw this nice enough? So you have your um, dividing line. Now, I did draw it now where it looks like it's in the middle. I didn't want to, uh, but let's leave it. The thing is, if you have it partitioned, you can just recursively sort this part and this part independently. Everything that is on the left here is already smaller than everything on the right, so there's never ever needed some exchange from some element here to some element over there. They're already nicely separated. That's why after partitioning, we just have two recursive calls, and we don't have to do anything when they come back. So the split is whatever the partition function returns, which may or may not be in the middle, but we know it's, it's this j. So the part up to j is the recursive call. The part behind j is, is the second part. And note that we exclude position j. This is exclusive notation. Because the pivot is actually at its final position. After one partitioning round, we got one element where it will be at the end. It isn't moved anymore. Uh, OK, so coming back to the choice of the pivot, you could do just the first element uh, or some other fixed position. That's a little dangerous for reasons we'll come to in a second. Um, better choices are either do it randomly or at least um, have several tries and uh, pick the best out of a small sample. Um, both are options that, that are reasonable in practice. And why do we care about this so much? That's the point of this question.
I see a clear trend, but it's just a um, third of the people or so. So I'll, I'll wait a little more. Okay, I guess many people have seen this before, so maybe speed up a bit. Uh, it's too many answers. The big, big bar comes here, and that's that's the right answer. Uh, the interesting part will be why. So let's recap that a bit. And before we get there, I want to point out something that I don't know if you have seen this, but it's just uh, a beautiful connection to something we have seen already. Uh, for that, let's um, let's have a look at at some example quicksort again. So how does quicksort work? It picks a pivot and then it partitions all the smaller numbers, all the bigger numbers, and puts the pivot in, in between. That was one partitioning step. Then we recursively do the same in the left. So again, pick a pivot, place it between the two partitions. Yep. Is quicksort be more than, would it, is there like, does the choice of pivot matter? Is like picking the middle of the pivot better or is it all worse? Uh, so the choice of the pivot definitely matters. Um, we'll, we'll come back to the question, what's a good, what's a good way to do it? Uh, it's, it's a little tricky in a way, uh, because you don't necessarily know up front what's a good one. But I think this, this might lead us exactly to that, to that uh, question back. So um, we have partitioned the, the left recursive call in the same way. In this example, I'm to make this correspondence really clean, I'm always picking the first element as the pivot. And I'm not using my fancy partitioning method, but I'm using a stable partitioning. As you see here, these, these numbers that are smaller than four, uh, smaller than seven, so in the first step, they appear in the same order down here. Uh, that's important for the correspondence. It's not important for the real result, it's just to make it nicer to show. Uh, I didn't want to comment on it, but now that uh, you asked detailed questions, I think it's probably more confusing if not. Um, okay, let's, let's speed that up a bit. So every part is eventually chosen as a, every number is eventually chosen as a pivot, be it only because it's in this base case where we only have a single element left. Um, right, and if I connect the recursive calls, so seven was the, the topmost partitioning step, and then we had two recursive calls, so I connect those and so on, we get a nice tree. Now let's do something else. Let's take these numbers and insert them in the binary search tree, just in the order left to right as they come. So we get the seven done. The four, smaller than seven, goes to the left, right? And you remember it replaces the leaf, and we do this pointer and so on. Well, you've seen that last week. Uh, 2 goes all the way to the left, uh, the 9 is bigger than 7, becomes a right child, and so on and so forth, right? You can, you can do this as some practice. Uh, and if you do this, I guess obvious, the two are the same trees. It's the very same shape if you just look at this connection part here and the binary search tree we got by just inserting. That's interesting, right? If you think about it, it's no coincidence. Because what a binary search tree does is pretty much like partitioning. And the correspondence goes bigger. So, I mean, everything that's smaller goes to the left, everything that's bigger that goes to the right. That's exactly what partitioning does, and that's what binary search trees do. So the, the trees look the same. If you think about it, it's actually even the exact set of comparisons that are done, either in quicksort or in building the tree, is the same. They do the same comparisons, they just reorder them. So quicksort first compares every one to the pivot and then goes on. In the binary search tree we don't do that at the start, but every element that's inserted starts by comparing with the root, which is the first pivot. So it's the same comparisons. And hence, if you count comparisons, the two things are the same. They have the same cost of sorting with quicksort or inserting into a binary search tree. And I mean, apart from just showing this beautiful connection, you can obviously exploit this to analyze quicksort, right? So we've already discussed what binary search trees uh, are good for and where they are, where they are bad. Um, in particular, this, this worst case for the height. 
also turns out to be a worst case for quicksort because then you can you can work this out as a sum the uh, the kth element has to travel down uh, k minus one previous ones so you get this sum of for the total cost and that's quadratic which uh, most of you answered so you've seen some of this before maybe not via this connection to search trees where this is becoming obvious in a way. Um, a good fix that I advertised for binary search trees already, but there I said, oh, this is a little tricky to do, so we'll skip it. I'll just teaser it. For quicksort, it's actually easy. If the input doesn't do you the favor of being in nice random order, you just make it so. And a not unreasonable way to sort is to first shuffle everything destroy any existing order, and then run quicksort. That's by and large often the fastest way to sort, with a little asterisk that will come, on, come to on Wednesday, I guess. Now, uh, I said we can exploit this connection to analyze quicksort, and people have done this to a much further extent. Um, if we count the same way as for merge sort, the number of element visits that quicksort does, we can again get a recurrence. Uh, it's a slightly less nice recurrence, so I'll spare you the details. Although I, I really hope you have seen it in some undergraduate class or want to look it up. Um, I can point you out to some places where it's written up. But I just want to present the result here. The final uh, solution for this recurrence for quicksort is, is the same. You have this n log base 2 of n, but with a different constant and a much smaller constant than for merge sort. And so that's, uh, at a high level, a good explanation why quicksort deserves its name. It's usually faster than merge sort. Uh, so this is for the randomized version, and these are expected costs. So it, it can happen that quicksort is awfully slow if you're extremely unlucky. Uh, but if you properly randomize, you will not live long enough to see it happen. Because you can prove more, not just this expectation bound. Instead, you can prove something like, the probability that you, yeah, that you see, I don't know, five times the, the expected cost uh, goes to zero when n becomes bigger. If that statement doesn't uh, feel very digestible, it's not too relevant. I'm just throwing this in to, um, to motivate the point that quicksort is not just good on, in expectation. You can actually say more about it. Um, yeah, maybe the, maybe the intuition. For quicksort to be bad, the pivot has to be very bad, so either very small or very big, so that the split is not very even, very far away from the middle. And to be really bad, you have to constantly be unlucky in this way. And that's unlikely. An individual bad pivot can happen, but you won't, you won't get this all the time. That's unlikely. OK, to finish off with quicksort, it is usually the fastest general purpose method for sorting. It deserves its name uh, for many interesting reasons. Um, so most, most practical implementations use some version of quicksort. Uh, also because it's in place, so you can sort without big extra memory requirements. The average case is fast. That's what I, what I just discussed. Uh, same as for merge sort, the axes are sequential. If you think back to partitioning, you always move these pointers towards each other, but they, they always just jump one forward. It has this nasty worst case, but it's not really a problem if you randomize. The only real downside is that it's not stable. At least the fast version we've seen, or partitioning without extra space. With a buffer, you can make it stable, but then you're back to merge sort territory. If you want to use the fast partitioning, it's not stable. Uh, and in a way, that's, that's still an open question. Nobody has come up with a convincing answer for this. Can you find an algorithm that's simple? fast in practice, and stable, and in place. It's like if you drop any of these, I can show you how to do it. Um, all together seems, seems n annoying. And this is not so esoterical, right? So you would like to have such a method. For fast, you just mean n log n, right? Uh, not quite. I mean, uh, with a reasonable constant. I mean really fast in terms of you can implement it in, in proper code 
and it's faster than some textbook quick sort. Yeah, you can play games like this. There's, okay, we'll we'll touch on this a little bit later. Uh, implementations in practice do more than just the basic versions. Um, I don't know if a combination of all these four print things. Question? Yeah, it's a is is a typical. So the question was, um, theta sounds like it should be average case. Big O sounds like it should be worst case, and maybe omega then uh, best case or, or lower bound. I think this is often uh, you often see people talking in these terms, so it's it's very natural to come to that conclusion. But I think this is completely orthogonal. One is so we're talking about. On one side, asymptotic approximations for a mathematical function, which could be anything. It doesn't need to be a runtime. And on the other side, we're talking about the data model for an algorithm. Are we pessimistic, optimistic, or random? <laughs> uh, that's one thing. And the two ha don't have much to do with each other. So say I can say I have a, a big omega bound for the worst case, because I know it's at least that bad. Somehow, I have proven that, maybe. Uh, and similarly, the theta just means you have a lower and an upper bound that just uh, have a constant factor in between them. And so you can say that about any function. And you can say that about the running time function for any of best, worst, average case, whatever you want to pick. It depends what you can prove. Uh, so I, I prefer to use theta because it's the most precise uh, of the three. Right? It tells you both it's not more than that and not less than that. It's exactly n log n with some, well, some bounds, constant n log n, other constant n log n, somewhere in between. If you can only prove an upper bound, then maybe you should just use O. Right? 